This is Colin Selleck of Binghamton University. This lecture is on chapters 13.1 through 13.3 from the book Dynamics by R.C. Hebeler. Today I'll discuss Newton's second law, the equation of motion, the equation of motion for a system of particles. Today's objectives include writing the equation of motion for an accelerating body and drawing the free body and kinetic diagrams for an accelerating body. Activities include applications, a discussion of Newton's law of motion, his law of gravitational attraction, and the equation of motion for a system of particles. And we'll do some problem solving. So here's a parachutist. The drag force is equal to the drag coefficient c times the square of the velocity. Can you calculate the velocity and acceleration of the parachutist at any point in time? This may be useful for landing purposes. Here's a tow truck towing carts b and c. If you know the frictional force of the wheels at a, can you calculate the velocity and acceleration? Can you determine the forces in the coupling between A and B? This would be useful in the design of the cart. Here a freight elevator is lifted using a motor attached to a cable and pulley system. How can we determine the tension force in the cable required to lift the elevator and load at any given acceleration? This is useful when deciding how big the cable should be. Now let's discuss Newton's laws of motion. The first law if a particle is at rest or moving with constant velocity, it will continue in that state as long as the resultant force acting on the particle is zero. The second law, if the resultant force on the particle is not zero, the particle experiences an acceleration in the same direction as the force. And this acceleration has a magnitude proportional to resultant force. And the third law, mutual forces of action and reaction between two particles are equal, opposite, and collinear. Now you use the first and third laws when you studied statics. Newton's second law is the basis of dynamics. Mathematically, we write it as force is equal to mass times acceleration. F is the resultant force, A is the acceleration of the particle, and M is the mass, it's positive, and it's a scalar. Now we do not use Newton's second law near the speed of light or for objects that are very, very, very small. In those cases, we turn to Einstein. Now, you may have seen this in physics class. This is Newton's law of gravitational attraction. It says that any two bodies have a mutually attractive gravitational force acting between them. And he also gave us the formula for that. It is the gravitational constant times the product of the masses of the two bodies divided by the distance between them squared. Now for our purposes near the surface of the Earth, the only gravitational force we're going to worry about is that between the Earth and the body, which we also call the weight of the body. Now it's very important to understand the difference between mass and weight. Mass is an absolute property of the body. It does not change in different gravitational fields. You have the same mass on the Earth as you do on the Moon, as you do on Jupiter. It can also be defined as the resistance of a body to a change in motion. Now the weight of the body is not an absolute value, it changes upon the gravitational field. So you weigh differently on the Earth than you do on the Moon, than you do on Jupiter. So weight is the mass times acceleration due to gravity. In SI system of units, the mass is a base unit and it has units of kilograms. Weight is a derived unit. It is mass times g, the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.81 meters per second squared in this system. In the FPS, or foot-pound-second system, the unit of mass is the slug, and it is the weight divided by the gravity. Gravity is g, which in these units is 32.2 feet second squared. It's very important. In the FPS system, you're usually given the weight and you have to divide by g to get the mass. In the SI system, you're usually given the mass and you multiply by g to get the weight. Now we'll move into section 13.2, the equation of motion. So the motion of a particle is governed by Newton's second law, F equal ma. If more than one force acts on the particle, the equation of motion can be written thusly, where the sum of forces is the resultant force. 
So this is nothing other than the vector addition of F2 and F1, for instance, and you're, as you can see here. Now, MA is sometimes called the kinetic diagram, and it's just a vector in the direction of A with magnitude M times A. Now, this equation of motion can only be used if the acceleration is measured in a Newtonian frame of reference. What does this mean? So for the most part in this course, we typically are concerned with motions at or near the Earth's surface. So we typically place our inertial frame fixed to the Earth. If you're doing satellite or rocket mechanics, the inertial frame of reference is often fixed to the stars. Now section 13.3, this is the equation of motion for a system of particles. Now we're going to extend the equation of motion to include uh, a number of particles. And this includes the motions of solids, liquids, or gas systems. So as you studied in statics, there are internal forces and external forces. So internal forces are the forces that are the reactions between particles between themselves. So it's, you know, particle having collisions or whatnot with each other have internal forces. External forces come from outside the system of the particles. Now, we can define M as the sum of the masses of the particles, and A sub G is the acceleration of the center of mass. In that case, M times acceleration due to gravity is equal to the sum of all the individual MAs. So for a system of particles, the summation of forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the center of gravity. And remember, we're only considering external forces. Some key points to take away from this. Newton's second law is not the result of any proof. It's from observation only. Mass is a property of an object, and it's a measure of the resistance to a change in velocity. Weight depends upon the local gravitational field, and the weight is equal to the mass times acceleration due to gravity. Unbalanced forces cause acceleration. This is the basis of all dynamic problems. So let's define a procedure on how to apply the equation of motion. So first, select a coordinate system. In this example here, perhaps I'll attach the coordinate frame to the ground at the wheel, front wheel location of A. Next is to draw a free body diagram showing all the external forces. So in this case, we have a block being pulled by a cable over a pulley here. And we know the angle theta. We can draw the free body diagram as, well, there's the weight of the body, mass times acceleration. There's this tension in the cable operating at some angle theta. There's some normal force between the block and the floor. And there's some frictional force, which is opposite direction of motion. And that would be mu times n, where mu is the coefficient of friction. Next is to draw the kinetic diagram, which usually is very simple. In this case, it's just a vector in the direction of acceleration times the mass. And next is to apply the equations of motion and their scalar components. So in this case, I'll put my coordinate frame here. I'll sum forces in the x direction. That is equal to the tension times the cosine of theta. And the other force in the x direction is minus mu times n. And that equals to the mass times the acceleration in the x direction, which I'm writing as x double dot. Some forces in the y. So the tension in the cable times the sine of theta plus n minus mg is equal to the mass times acceleration in the y direction. And now, depending on what knowns you're given, you can solve these equations for the unknowns. Now, note that you may need to use chapter 12 and kinematic relations to generate some additional equations. For instance, in this example here, if I know how fast the motor is spinning, what is the speed of the elevator? So let's do an example. We have a 25 kilogram block it is subjected to a force of 100 newtons. The spring has a stiffness of 200 newtons per meter 
and it's unstretched in this position here. So the unstretched length is 0.3 meters. The contact surface is smooth, and whenever you see that, that just means that the frictional force is zero. So you do not consider mu n. So let's draw the free body and kinetic diagrams when s is equal to 0.4. So briefly, the plan is to find the coordinate system, draw the free body diagram, and then draw the kinetic diagram. So the solution, step one, we'll define the inertial xy frame as fixed to the ground. Step two, draw a free body diagram on the block. So for the position shown, the spring is, this is 0.4 meters and this is 0.3 meters. So the spring is stretched to 0.5 meters. And you remember the unstretched length was 0.3 meters. Therefore, the change in length of the spring is 0.5 minus 0.3 or 0.2 and K is 200 newtons per meter. So the force in the spring is 40 newtons. So the free body diagram would look like this, a horizontal force of 100 newtons, the spring force of 40 newtons at an angle of three on four, and the normal force. Remember, they said a smooth surface, so there is no frictional force. And the kinetic diagram is very simple. It is m times acceleration in the horizontal direction. Here's another problem. We have a block of mass m and a cylinder of mass m, and the coefficient of kinetic friction at all contact surfaces is mu draw the free body and kinetic diagrams of each block. What's our plan? Define the coordinate frame, draw the free body diagrams, and draw the kinetic diagram. So for block A, we have the weight m times g, we have the normal force between the block and the ground, we have the frictional force which is mu times n, and we have tension in the cable. Now for the cylinder, since there's a pulley system on here, and the tension in the cable is upwards like this, the free body diagram will be 2 times the tension in the cable and the weight m times g. Now there's no friction here because there's no contact with any sliding surface. This concludes sections 13.1 through 13.3. Next up, section 13.4, Equation of Motion for Rectangular Coordinates.